Next time you need to get work done on your home, or your car, or your garden, make sure you choose a trader you can trust. And don't just choose any trader, choose a which trusted trader. Our trading standards professionals only endorse traders who've passed our rigorous assessment that includes credit reports, customer satisfaction surveys, reference checks, and interviews. When we say a trader is good enough to display our Witch Trusted Trader logo, you can trust us. But don't take our word for it. Search Witch Trusted Traders online to see our directory of around 4,000 traders. Every customer review you read there is verified genuine by our moderators, so you can choose with confidence. To find a local trader you can trust, search Witch Trusted Traders or go to witch.co.uk forward slash traders. That's witch.co.uk forward slash traders. Everybody needs a trader they can trust. When life gives you questions, which get answers. Welcome to the Witch Money Podcast, your weekly hit of money news and personal finance hacks to help make you better off. I'm your host, Lucia Ariano, and here's what's coming up this week. There's other stuff around consumer research we've done and we've asked people how they're feeling about their finances and about a third were less confident now about their financial future than previously. Pensions can be very, very complicated and it can be intimidating for some people to even get started, even to take those first steps to even look at their pension statements. So I think just never be afraid. There's no such thing as a stupid question. This week, we're looking at the finances of pensioners. Now, it's often said that the older generation are considered to be at a financial advantage, but is that really the case? We'll be looking at how things have changed, what it's like for retirees in 2024, and the kinds of benefits you or your loved ones could be claiming. And to help us explain this and much more along the way, I'm sure, today we're joined by Paul Davies, Principal Researcher here at WITCH, and Lily Megson, Policy Director at My Pension Expert. Welcome to you both. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, thanks for having us. Hello. Well, shall we start then? I mean, Paul, this idea that pensioners are part of some kind of of golden era that they've had it easier than the rest of us you know where does this come from and is there anything in it so this is a really contentious area so the average age that people are retiring is still around 65 so if you're looking at people who've retired over the last 10 years or who will retire over the next five years so these people have had some quite big advantages really in terms of managing their finances over the years they might have had access to a final salary pension that's really generous They might have been buying property at a time when house prices were on the rise so they could um, get on the property ladder and pay off a big part of their mortgage. So housing costs are minimal now. They probably went to university at a time when there were no tuition fees. They might have received a maintenance grant. So money to live on at university and then not coming away from university with a huge amount of debt. All these things contribute to the notion that these people are part of a golden generation mm. and they had it all in their favour. We will, of course, be getting into the challenges pensioners face as we go through the show, but can we just start off with with an overview? Yeah, and, you know, we're talking about pensioners here. That's 12 million people. You've, you've got wealth levels across the spectrum. You know, many will be well off. Some will be somewhere in the middle. And then you've got People that don't have a lot of excess cash will be living on on the edge of poverty and will be struggling to make ends meet and will mm. we'll depend on, you know, the state pension to to make sure that, you know, they can have an, an adequate lifestyle. Mm. So we're, we're talking about a big group of people, so we, we can't generalise, but there's some trends that we're noticing about pension of wealth is starting to plateau a little bit. There's other stuff around consumer research we've done and we've asked people how they're feeling about their finances and about a third were less confident now about their financial future than previously. Mm. So, you know, on the back of COVID and high inflation, you know, the stock market's taken a bit of a beating. There's, there's lots of stuff out there that, that might have impacted their wealth and how they feel about uh, financing their future. Mm. And again, we've spoken to lots of pensioners over the last six months and, you know, st- stuff like paying for healthcare or private dentistry um, mm. because they have to or they're not prepared to sit on waiting lists for, you know, for months on end. The- these sort of factors that might not have been important in the past are, are becoming more important and people are having to almost 
plan for a retirement where they're having to spend quite a lot of money on, on private healthcare and dentistry. So that th- there are new factors at play that are changing changing stuff for pensioners. And and Lily, can we hear from you as well? So you're with us today from my pension expert and you're in the thick of it, no doubt hearing from retirees every week. So what's the mood you're hearing at the, at the moment? I mean, I have to say the mood right now amongst the clients that we've been talking to, it's a little bit of nerves, a little bit of uncertainty. Mm. I mean, of course, there's wider costs, wider economic uh, circumstances such as inflation, volatility, interest rate volatility as well. However, one of the key issues we're discussing with our clients at the moment is I mean, it's the lead up to the budget, pension tax relief and access to tax free cash. I think those are two issues which are they're largely being spec- speculated in the press. And it's unnerving quite a lot of people because these are people who have worked very hard, saved hard for retirement, carefully planned their entire path to retirement. They know the type of lifestyle they want. And because all of these rumours are coming out. Perhaps they're not going to be able to access the amount of money that they'd initially planned. There's a bit of concern about how their retirement plans might go up in smoke. Of course, mm. our recommendation is always never never make any snap decision based on a rumour. It's always best to wait, see what the facts are, and then work with an advisor, work with a professional to plan and make sure that you do remain on track for your retirement. But at the moment, it's that sort of uncertainty, which I think it's just causing a little bit of nerves around our clients at the moment. Well, we'll be coming back to this, I'm sure, on whether anything does or doesn't change. Um, We've got a special budget podcast and the budget is on the 30th of October. So we'll come back to this point then. But for now then, can we just talk about this subject of support kind of narrowing for the older generation now. So, Paul, um, the big story uh, that's that's still rumbling on, actually, is the decision to change the way the winter fuel allowance is given out. Can you remind us of the details of this? So, up until now, all pensioners, so 11.5 million pensioners, have received a payment in in the autumn of between £200 and £300 to, to put towards their energy bills. And exactly how much you get depends on your age and how many people are in your household. But Rachel Reeves has decided that only those who claim pension credit or other means-tested benefits are going to get it in the future. Mm. So the number of people receiving it will drop from 11.5 million down to about 1.5 million. So this is a, 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 you know, a substantial blow for people and their budgeting. It's one we've been tracking over a number of years and we, we've asked pensioners what they feel feel about the winter fuel payment. A few months ago when we asked, 49% of people said it should be kept for everyone. 46% said it should be means tested. So pensioners are split down the middle, basically. So they a lot of pensioners understand that it's it's unfair at the moment that everyone gets it. If you're a millionaire, for mm. example, you get the winter fuel payment. And again... When we've we've spoken to people, they've said that they use it to give money to their grandchildren at Christmas. Mm. They use it to book their next holiday or towards mm. their next holiday. Lots of people give it towards charity. It feels like the system hasn't been quite right. Whether the change is exactly spot on will be seen. One of the positive consequences of the change is more people are applying for pension credit who should be receiving it. There's been about 800,000 people who could claim it but haven't done so. So I I was reading the other day that already 100,000 more people are claiming pension credit. Wow. It's having a a positive unintended consequence of, Mm. you know, more people that are struggling are going to receive pension credit. But the the debate will rumble on. It is sad to say that that more pensioners are slipping into poverty. And and according to projections, the number is only set to increase. Um, Paul, can you talk about whether the type of pension you have contributes to this? I'll just go back a bit further in terms of Mm. pension of poverty and how that sort of developed over the last few decades. Because lots of this is on the back of a report by Independent Age a few months ago where they, they predicted that the number of pensioners in poverty would increase from roughly 2 million at present to around 4 million in 2040. So over the next 15 years, you're, you're going to get many more people um, in poverty. And poverty is defined by if a household has 60% or less than the average income across all households, mm. so working households as well. So if you've got less than 60% of the average, you're 
you're designated as being in poverty. You know, that that's a frightening prospect in that, you know, that number of pensions in poverty is going to potentially double over the next 15 years. So in, in, the, in the 70s, 80s and 90s, you know, up, up to 45% of household, pensioner households were in poverty. Then things improved over the next couple of decades due to, as you say, lots of people with good pension provision. Lot, lots of people had final salary pensions. Pension credit was introduced in 2003. So again, people at the bottom end, people that are really on the edge of being able to cope, had a boost to their incomes. So that also helped. I mentioned home ownership and getting on the property ladder earlier. In the 90s and early 2000s, people benefited from a huge boom in housing prices so that, you know, they were on the property ladder. Uh, they could pay their mortgage mainly. Lots of them now own their houses outright. You know, they've got no real housing costs in retirement. So all, all, all those things contributed to pensioners being really dragged up into a, a much better position. But the, the signs are now, um, as I say, the independent age report is quite gloomy. But looking at um, average income for pensioners, that sort of plateaued and is dropping a bit over the last few years. So from being a really poor situation a few decades ago, that improving, now there's warning signs that they might be slipping back a bit in terms of their overall financial position. And I suppose if you're renting as well, then you don't have that security of not paying. Obviously, if you've paid off your mortgage, then then great, that's one thing off your list. But if you're renting, renting prices are soaring, aren't they? So... Yeah, that, that's another thing the Independent Age Report looked at. The, there's a huge rise in the number of renters over the age of 60. Mm. A, again, in the past, these people might have got on the property ladder, paid off their mortgage or, or have a relatively small mortgage at retirement. But now the financial cost of having to pay rent is sort of the uncertainty, you know, not always being able to live where you want to or potentially having mm. to move. And, you know, w- once you get older and you assume you, you slip into a nice comfortable retirement where everything is fixed and mm. you know it's 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 sort of happy days for there on the, these these things do add uncertainty and and financial pressures and lily what would you say public knowledge is like on this topic is there a sense that if people don't know how their pension works are you kind of unknowingly stepping towards trouble I think, unfortunately, that is the case. I mean, the the UK has been facing a massive um, and ever-widening pension engagement gap. And this is across all age groups, uh, which is quite quite concerning. I mean, my pension expert conducted our own research, and it's found that 56% of Britons in full-time employment just find pensions too confusing and too complicated, and therefore just are put off engaging completely. But of course, as, as you mentioned, that sets a vicious spiral of not wanting to engage, not engaging. And then that leads to a great deal of financial anxiety. I mean, that same report we uh, conducted found that 45% of people actively avoid thinking about retirement just because it makes them anxious. In order to address this engagement gap and help people to understand as early as possible what the pension is, the importance of workplace contributions and how it can benefit them, is making sure the information is clear, accessible and really relates to them. Accessibility and clarity of information could be absolutely vital in this and it's a simple step which of course it's one of many steps that need to be taken in order to make sure that people are correctly saving for retirement but I think that could be a really positive step in the right direction of helping people of all ages work to avoid unknowingly sleepwalking into pension poverty. It's one thing if you're getting these these quarterly updates and you're keeping on top of it but many of us have many different pension pots all over the place that actually do we have track of i mean i'm i know i'm guilty of of not really keeping track of all the many pension pots i have from previous jobs and i think that's that's the case for many of us isn't it oh completely completely and the i mean when i first first joined the workforce which admittedly a little bit longer ago than i (laughs) care to admit but um I had some some colleagues who are also my age who were actively opting out of pensions, so moving job to job, just not keeping track. And firstly, it as you say, you just lose track and you've you fail to engage. And then again, by the it's almost a bit too late to um, to do anything. But I think the problem is it's quite a complex process to track down those pensions. We've got the government tracing um, tracing service online. It, it doesn't actively give you your uh, pension information. It just, all you need to know is the name of your employer and if you have it, the name of the, your provider or their provider. And then it just gives you the contact details. So 
this is why uh, the government really needs to prioritise the pension dashboard because that has... <laughs> it's something we've spoken about a lot on the show for actually many years now. No, it, it could be a game changer and I'm sure I'm not the I'm, I'm not unique in this, uh, in this view, I'll be honest with you. Well, until we hear more about the pension dashboard, hopefully we will soon. It's all about the government's tracing service until then and keeping on top of it yourself. Well, after the break then, we'll be coming back to the topic and giving you plenty of tips to help whether you're a pension now or soon to be one or if you're just looking to set yourself up for the future we'll be back after this life can get hectic when you start a family but which can help you make confident decisions from improving your home to financial planning we'll make sure you're prepared whether you're looking to reduce your household bills seeking advice around your child's health or want to find our best buys for your new home which has got you covered Use our expert advice to make the right choices for you and your growing family by visiting witch.co.uk forward slash growing family. That's where you'll find everything you need to make confident decisions and have peace of mind that all the advice you're getting is 100% independent. So to find out more, just head to witch.co.uk forward slash growing family. Now, before we get back to Paul and Lily, I just want to play you a snippet of the exclusive event we held earlier this week for Witch Money members. This was the first of our one hour long bonus episodes where money editors Jenny Ross and Sam Richardson joined me to discuss the six steps to boost your savings. The bad news is we are definitely past the peak now in terms of rates. The good news is that rates are still, I mean, relatively healthy, certainly in the context of rates over the past decade. So now really is a great time to take stock review your savings and just make sure your money is working as hard as it possibly can and obviously that is why we are all here tonight you know okay with these smaller banks you might be concerned about customer service for instance i've never heard of them who are they are they even genuine when we survey savings customers for our annual reports on the best banks the which recommended providers we get, the ones with excellent customer scores as well as excellent interest rates are generally smaller providers. It's a savings platform called Raisin and these are interesting organisations within the savings landscape in that they are basically a one-stop shop. I'm a very sore loser (laughs) about this at the moment because I uncovered a £100 uh, premium bond whilst cleaning out my flat and this bond is probably about 20 years old. I typed the number into NSNI's online prize checker and I've won nothing. Okay, so I think it's now Q&A time. Bob is asking, are pensions on a savings platform still only protected up to 85k? Pensions have their own FSCS protection limit, so pensions are definitely treated separately. I like this one. Guesses on changes in the budget on ISA or any other predictions. That's from Nigel. Can I start? I'm going to say that I think ISAs will be left alone. I agree with Sam. I haven't heard much noise in the way of, you know, changes that will specifically affect savings, you know, ISAs. But you've got to think about things like capital gains tax feels almost nailed on at this point. And that is, again, another reason why ISAs are more attractive because you've got that lovely tax free wrapper. So that was exclusive to Which Money members. If you're a member and can join us, just check your emails as there'll be a link to watch back. And if you're not already a member and want to join us next time, head to the link in the show notes to find out how to become a member. Now back to today's show and something I wanted to bring into the conversation, it feels a bit doom and gloom, but it's life expectancy. As we live longer, we have to make our money stretch further. But but as you wrote in your recent article, Paul, there is more to it than that, isn't there? That's right. And it is quite gloomy, to be mm. honest. But the upshot is that people are living longer lives, but not necessarily healthier lives. Average life expectancy has, has stayed quite steady, actually. I think it's, it's it's around 86 for women and 83 for men. But something called healthy life expectancy is dropping. So this is the period of, of your lifetime where you're designated in very good or good health. And it's dropped about a year for for men and about 1.2 years for women over the last five years. And that that's in... England, Scotland and Wales. I think it's gone up a little bit in Northern Ireland, actually. It's concerning, isn't it? Yeah. If you're thinking about having to provide for your retirement and working as long as possible to make sure you've got a sufficient pot, if you reach 
a stage where you're in your early 60s say and you know you might be doing quite a manual job and your your health might be on on the wane a little bit so you're almost having to factor in a longer period of retirement because you you may be stopping work earlier than you wanted to but your life expectancy is is still quite long in the past we talked quite often about a 20-year retirement but again there were some figures last week from the ONS that said there was a record number of people over the age of 90. I think there was 550,000 people which had gone up by about half in the last two decades so again you know lots of people are living for longer but they might have to deal with some poor health from quite an early age and it it harks back to the point I made earlier about people having to spend more money in Mm. retirement on on healthcare and dentistry and and the like um, before they even think about long-term care if if that's an eventuality that that will happen in the end. So what does this mean for pension pots then? Lily are we just expected to make our money last longer? I mean, at the face of it, that's the way it does semi-look. I mean, as um, as Paul said, of course, there's a lot of financial pressures if someone is in poor health. However, even if you are healthy, there are certain considerations that might need to be made, especially as the state pension age is going to increase as well. If you are a bit healthier, that one of the considerations could be just to work that little bit longer, just to bridge that gap, really. Because, um, as I say, one of the concerns a lot of people will have is if they dip too early into their pension or too early into those investments and in assets. So, um, that is a concern. However, one of the ways in which that can be manage slightly is start thinking as early as possible like when do you want to retire because even if you are healthy and you are going to live a bit longer some people might be working longer and there are certain circumstances which can hopefully take the pressure off for a bit so people can still enjoy the retirement that they want I think that sort of planning and that's whilst I say no people younger in the workforce probably don't really want to think about retirement at this point. I think um, be, being realistic at the, about life expectancy, whilst you will be expected probably to for your money to last a bit longer, there are steps you can take. So it doesn't need to be a scary, scary prospect. And in terms of taking the pressure off and easing concerns then, um, Paul, can we bring in uh, the state pension and the triple lock here? Because that's a, a phrase that's that's used quite a lot that's been used a lot in recent years um can you remind us what it is and and how it's been a a huge help if so to to pensioners yeah so the the state pension triple lock guarantee means that every year the state pension will rise by the highest of average earnings inflation in september the previous year or 2.5 percent so if you were in a situation whereby earnings were low and inflation say it was one percent pensioners would still get that 2.5 percent minimum so th- th- this has been around for about 14 years i think it, it came into force in 2010 2011 and on the back of the introduction of the guarantee the state pension's gone up by 60 percent mm. over that time so you know a substantial rise and More it, probably than a lot of people's wages in that time <laughs> I think wages in real terms are about steady Mm. um, over that period. So it brings in the question of intergenerational fairness. Are pensions being favoured here over the younger generations? And again, we asked pensioners what they felt about the state pension triple lock. It was a bit of a case of turkeys for for Christmas, but um, 70% said it should stay. So roughly 30% felt that it was unfair in their favour to be honest mm-hmm. so again they were getting big big rises where people on other other benefits weren't getting the the, the the same increases well shall we talk then about how we can all prepare um for those years shall, shall we start with people who are looking to retire soon so lily say in, in the next few years what should you be doing to prepare I mean, I think probably most importantly is getting to grips with your current financial situation. So that involves looking at how many pension parts fit and also making sure that you know how many pension parts you have and taking steps to track any down, um, which are not 
not too sure about. And also taking stock as well of various other assets you might have. So if you've got any investments, if you've got an ISA, if you have any assets that are tied up with property, I think taking stock of all of those factors can give you a really good idea of your current financial position. And then it's important to um, consider your retirement objectives. So what type of lifestyle do you want? How many times a year do you want to go on holiday, for example? And also, if you have any immediate big spends you want to spend your money on when you do decide to retire, when you hit that date. So for example, do you want to take your family on a big holiday to celebrate? Have you got a family wedding coming up? Do you want to finally do up the house? So it's those sorts of factors as well, which I think really need the short and long term factors in retirement, which need to be considered. And once you have an idea of your current situation and where you want to be in 5, 10, 20 years time. I think it's very, very important to use information available to you, such as free guidance, which can be easily found online, to have a general idea of uh, the different options available to you, what might suit your needs. And from there, I think it's a really good idea to seek independent financial advice. And how does it differ then... Uh, if we're thinking a bit more longer term, so if you're in your your 20s, your 30s, your 40s, your 50s, um, if you're still a little way off, how would you recommend getting ready for retirement? I mean, not too dissimilar. However, it's probably more important to make use of all the educational tools available to you first. I think also engaging with your employer as well asking them about details about your um, workplace pension, for example, asking for clear information, explaining exactly what the contributions are, where they're going. And even if you're not interested at doing uh, doing so at this specific time, asking about opportunities regarding increasing your contributions. I think even if, particularly for those um, younger members of the workforce, it it might not be a concern, but I think really making use of the information as early as possible could really lay the groundwork for when you do get a little bit older and feel that you should start, again, maybe not actively planning, but thinking about pensions, also keeping track of your pensions. This sort of information could be a really, really good starting point. Is there anything you'd add to that, Paul? I think the, the point about starting early is really interesting. I was, I was reading a press release by a company uh, in the last week about a 40-year saving plan as part of your retirement. So that would that would have you starting in your mid-20s. Um, I know when I was in my mid-20s, I wasn't thinking about a 40-year plan. I was thinking about a seven-day plan, how much I could go out and afford <laughs> to spend on going out. Um, so... It's it's a good point, but it, we have to be realistic in terms of people have other priorities and other stuff to spend money on. But the other side of the coin is again when I when I was in my twenties, my my employer at the t- time started putting ten pounds into a pension, mm-hmm. um, and that was the first company pension that I had. That's sort of at the start, in the middle. Keep a track of your pensions, how much they're worth. Um, we we've got a good calculator called the pension calculator. How how much will you have? And you can put in your, your current amount and you can project your earnings going forward as, as best you can guess. And that will um, give you a final pot size. So that, that's quite a nice calculator to, to use. Try to answer the question, how much will you need to retire? That, that Again, as Lily said, that's really hard in terms of what you intend to do, where you intend to live, how mm-hmm. you intend to spend your money. But there's there's some nice tools by the, the Pensions and Lifetime Saving Association that, that have what constitutes a minimum moderate and comfortable retirement so i'll I'll give you an example to to get a moderate retirement uh which is the middle of the three levels for a couple it means building up a pot of around four hundred thousand pounds so there's you know there's your target and it's quite a hard target but with with the state pension alongside that and the money you saved and you know as i say if 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 it's a couple and there's two of you that's sort, sort of achievable if you start early and Again, as we mentioned earlier, it's it's considering when you stop working because the longer you work, the higher your you know you, you'll still be being paid a wage. Money will still be going into your pension, so you, you're building up instead of drawing down. Mm-hmm. So even even extending that a couple of years will improve your situation. And it it may be that you you have a phased retirement. You know, we talk about retirement. It's it's not normally a sort of a dropping off a cliff edge mm-hmm. for people. They might 
cut down their hours, do a few days. You know, hopefully they're working for an em- employer that, who is flexible and will allow them to sort of shift their working pattern a mm. little bit. And, you know, that, that might suit people. Again, you know, you're slowing down. Um, you're, you're wanting to spend more time with the grandkids or whatever, more holidays. So hopefully over the next few years, over the next couple of decades, that sort of flexible retirement, that phase retirement will become more of an option for people. Um, and so they can, you know, they can do it at their own pace. But, you know, having a few more years, even if you're working a couple of days a week, will improve your financial situation, you know, by a huge margin. Mm. Well, we'll get a few of those links that you mentioned there, Paul, into the show notes of today's um, podcast. And before we wrap up, then, can we just bring it back to retirees now? And in fact, the benefits that are available to pensioners, we, we've mentioned pension credit a little bit along the way. And this is important for anyone who is retired listening to the show, but also to you if you have parents or grandparents that might be retired or retiring soon. So, Paul, could you just run us through some of the benefits available to pensioners? Yeah, so, so pension credit is basically a top up if your your income is quite low. So if, if you've got little in the way of private pensions or your state pension is quite low because you haven't had the national insurance qualifying years. So pension credit will build your income up to a minimum of £220 a week, or it's just under £220 actually, for a single person and just over £330 a week if you're a couple. Mm -hmm. So it's a top up to make sure you're getting that as as a minimum payment. Mm -hmm. And also make sure you're getting any any free benefits out there. Um, we, we talked about the winter fuel payment. Obviously, you only get that now if you're getting pension credit. Mm. But make, you know, free prescriptions. I- explore all the, the the free travel benefits you can get in terms of um, freedom pass, and you know the, the the free travel will vary depending on where you live. And it's more generous in some areas, but there's there's the baseline of, of of a benefit there. So make sure you're making use of that. And you know any any benefits that, that retailers or leisure providers, you know, quite often that they have um, View Cinema used to have silver screenings that were you know cheap cinema tickets. Mm. There's, there's lots of those sort of um, benefits out there. So make sure you you do do a bit of research and do a bit of exploring. Um, and yeah, make make use of those. To wrap up then, can we just have any kind of final advice from you both? Um, anything from the show you'd like to stress or anything to add? Lily, do you want to start us off? Firstly, probably just to repeat what I've said before, it's never too early to just start planning. And also, I just think never be afraid to ask a stupid question. Pensions can be very, very complicated and it can be intimidating for some people to even get started, even to take those first steps to even look at their pension statement. So I think just never be afraid. There's no such thing as a stupid question and it'll just help you in the long term better understand your current situation and help you get where you want to be in future. Again, I heart back to something Lily said about lost pensions. It's, you know, it's ridiculous. It's billions of pounds of lost pensions mm. where people work for a company and just... It's heartbreaking. Look, it's a gutting, yeah. isn't it? The oh, idea of that. It's unbelievable. Um, and so... You know, try and again, pensions isn't the most exciting subject for everyone, but just try and be a little bit organised. Keep keep your statements. I know it's a mixture of paper statements and online logins, mm. and you know, but almost you know, put in half an hour a month is that too much? I don't know, half an hour a quarter. Yeah, <laughs> just just to, just to have a look at all your stuff and make sure it's it, it's all in order. And just don't don't lose a pension. You know that's 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 the worst thing in the world where you work for a company mm. and the company's put money in, you put money in, and it's just sat there and it's of no good to anyone. So yeah, you use use the, the pension tracing tools that Lily mentioned, but also do your own bit of admin and bit bit of homework to make sure stuff isn't lost. Well, that has been a mammoth episode. Thank you both so much for joining us. We've covered so much ground. So thank you both. Thank, thank you. you. Nice to talk to you. Well, a huge thank you again to Paul and Lily for coming on the show today and to you for listening to this week's episode of the Witch Money Podcast. If you enjoyed today's show, please do hit subscribe to make sure you catch our new episodes as soon as they drop. For daily money news and advice, you can find us on social media at Witch Money and online at witch.co.uk forward slash money. And we also have a free money newsletter, which is delivered to your inbox every Monday. To sign up, visit witch.co.uk forward slash money newsletter. This episode of the Witch Money podcast was written and presented by me, Lucia Ariano, and produced and edited by James Ray.
If you're enjoying this Witch podcast, then you might also be interested in listening to other podcasts that we have to offer, like Witch Shorts. Witch Shorts is our weekly podcast that brings you a flavour of what the Witch magazine has to offer, as well as our dedicated travel, gardening and tech magazines too. Each week we handpick a review, investigation or feature that was printed in one of our magazines and written by one of our award-winning writers. We then bring it to life on the podcast. So, to get a taster of what Witch members get in our suite of magazines, be sure to listen to Witch Shorts wherever you get your podcasts.